They actually sort of recognize that, uh, you know, which would represent passive dissemination. They, they've actually developed a number of initiatives within the country to promote diffusion, adoption, or integration within the care homes. And uh, uh, the aware- what would be described as awareness raising to strategy to introduce guidelines to staff where they'd actually have facilitators come into these homes and promote its use. There's a provision of education and training related to the guidelines. And also uh, there's a sort of a network newsletter which is diffused across the country as well. I think what's, and so once, once again we're seeing that is uh, from a central state perspective, there's a comprehensive palliative care strategy, as in the UK, which is being rolled out in, in Australia. So those are two jurisdictions which have a similar approach in terms of addressing end-of-life palliative care. Let's go on to the other end of the continuum, those countries which rank ninth on The Economist. And uh, we'll start with the states. And uh, this here is... Uh, one thing I should also say is that, going back to Australia, is that... Um, they also tied those guidelines into accreditation as well, so that uh, facilities are sort of there's been the accreditation organizations, uh, organizations responsible for accreditation are encouraged to evaluate or accredit those institutions according to the guidelines as well. So there's an integration there. So there's systemic thinking about how these pieces fit. In the United States, this report was report, uh, developed in 2008. It was an environmental scan in terms of what's happening in the United States, and they, the, the intent was to develop uh, best practices. And this is what they determined, is that um, uh, is effective uh, palliative care consultation service, hospice-based palliative care consultation, uh, the uh, sort of capacity building within the facility itself, and of course, the Medicare hospice care. Uh, briefly said, the first two really speaks to sort of the role of external services coming, being purchased or being, and being brought into the facility itself. The third piece really times into the uh, culture change movement in long-term care, that being the eating concept or the pioneer movement, where there's a push, and this ties into my earlier comment, to sort of change the culture within long-term care from that what would be described as the medical model of care to more of a humanistic model of care uh, for both residents and also changing the relationships among staff members as well, but in doing so has an impact in terms of uh, how an individual in long-term care is treated at the the later stages of life. So not precisely focusing on on the death and dying phase of life, but rather improving life in general and consequently improving the end as well. That's what we mean by culture change. And of course, there's the Medicare hospice uh, 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 eligibility uh, package, which is uh, available for those people who are seek it or are eligible. The conclusion, of course, is that one model will not solve all needs. So the authors of that report say that there's a number of factors that this context influences practice. And they cited that with respect to those models, these are some of the factors that can influence adoption and practice, both nursing home factors and community factors. The other piece which they did acknowledge with respect to those four approaches is the importance with respect to education and training within the organizations and primary care physicians. I have five minutes. And we're coming to Canada. Canada was extremely hard to do. And I think it's because it's, uh, quite frankly, a fragmented environment. And I sort of use the expression balkanization. And those of us who know the system here, we have a federal government who sort of uh, hands an envelope to the provinces. And certainly in the context of Ontario, we have regionalization as well. So the landscape with respect to what's practiced in long-term care is certainly, in the, even in the province of Ontario, can be variable. So there's an absence of consistency and standardization which we've witnessed both in the UK and Australia. That said, what are we doing? Well, I'm not quite sure, to be honest with you, because there is a sort of a profound information gap. And, uh, but one thing I did land on was this particular booklet here, which was developed by a colleague of mine, uh, Marcella Hand, who is... Uh, I always get his name mixed up with a French-Canadian movie star, so, <laughs> which I'm sure he would appreciate. But uh, my, he's at the university. He's a family physician, the University of uh, Sherbrooke, and he's developed this particular book called Comfort Care at the End of Life. And uh, its mainstay is really sort of best practice in advanced dementia. Its, go- its goals are such, and I'm going to move fast. We can talk about this later. And what we're doing right now is an acceptability study where we've taken this booklet and we've translated it into Dutch, Italian, and Japanese, 
and we're actually looking at its, its uptake or adoption to providers and families in different contexts. I should also add that the WHO has actually identified this booklet as a best practice document as well. So it's something to keep on, something to follow. The, um, we're going to move to the final piece. And um, my slides have disappeared, or my papers. Where do we go from here? There's two things to bear in mind the notion of transfer, transferability and the notion of sustainability. And this is what's really important in this particular context. Transferability speaks to the idea is uh, something which has been developed outside the long-term care context and is being introduced in long-term care. As does it work? And, uh, and it's this issue of culture and culture clash. And my earlier comment in terms of the model of palliative care, which was historically developed from a cancer, younger population perspective may not necessarily be the appropriate definition or approach with respect to what long-term care homes should be embracing. And in fact, what long-term care should be doing is embracing its own model and redefining and reasserting itself with, with respect to what death and dying means in that particular environment, the unique characteristics. And quite often, those initiatives which I described to you, it's, uh, there are quite frequently issues of cultural clash or adoption within the long-term care sector, even where you have these broad national agendas. It's really sort of fitting into the current environment. Sustainability. Sustainability speaks to the issue that um, uh, when we introduce change, more often than not, I have two minutes, they're shallow. And the, what's required in terms of sort of introducing enduring, profound change within the long-term care environment is what would be described as a, syst a systems perspective, uh, where you're sort of targeting the individual, the provider around education and training, recognizing the team that that individual is embedded in, recognizing the, the institution that the uh, team is embedded in, and also understanding the broader sort of policy, fund policy perspective that impacts on in in that uh, environment. Essentially what we're talking about here is relational accountability. And, how, and what's the relation that these various elements have within each other, and to what extent are they mutually supporting to improve uh, quality care of uh, residents in long-term care? I think that's my presentation. And also, in terms of sustainability, we really do need to sort of uh, recognize other challenges and initiatives that long-term care is dealing with, and how do we introduce these innovations so they're mutually supporting. Two examples is the new legislation and, of course, residence force. So when we're talking about change in terms of improving care of the dying, what are the facilities currently facing and how can we integrate? This here actually will, is sort of a resource. I think these will be made available to you later on. So you can, these will take you to the original documents that uh, I gave the presentation on. And uh, we're going to close there. So thank you very much. <laughs>